G'day, how you doing? My name is Adam. I teach chemistry and physics in year 11 and 12 up in Darwin. Uh, I got my degree from the Australian Defence Force Academy, a Bachelor of Science. I spent 12 years in the military, jumped ship in Darwin and became a teacher. And now, other than teaching science, I also like doing liquid nitrogen ice cream for um, school kids and launching model rockets. Right, straight into it, x-rays. On uh, one side, the um, image of Wilhelm Röntgen. He uh, is a German mechanical engineer who developed the X-ray tube. And on the other side is a picture of his wife's hand, hand mit ringen, uh, which is a picture of his wife's hand with a ring, and it was the first X-ray uh, officially released in the 22nd of December, 1895. Okay, quick bit of revision. You'll need to remember that if you have two parallel plates, let's say for this example, this one's negative and this one's positive, then, and you were to draw the field lines, then it's going to go this way because you've got to think, where is that positive test charge going to go? As in the minuscule positive charge. Like charges repel and opposite charges attract. Now, if you're an electron, for example, which is going to be on this side and you're E minus, you're going to get, want to get pushed away from the negative side and go over towards the positive. And that is the basis for how an X-ray tube works. Uh, here's a very basic X-ray tube. The electrons are released here and they go across the tube and smash into the metal target there. It is done in a vacuum because if air was present in the tube, it would prevent the tube from being able to do its work efficiently. You don't want air getting in the way of all the electrons leaving on the left and going through to the right to smash into the target metal. The X-ray is produced come out down the bottom and they can then be used for whatever purpose you intend them for. Here's a more basic image of the X-ray tube. Uh, what you can see here is that you've got your cathode, which is C, and your anode, which is A. The electrons leave the cathode, cross the electric field and arrive at the anode. As they cross the electric field, they accelerate, remembering that F equals EQ. So you've got the electric field strength E times the charge on the electron and they're getting a force. If it's getting a force, F equals MA, it must accelerate. If it's accelerating, it's gaining kinetic energy. Those ele electrons gain a mountain of kinetic energy and then smash into the target there. Most of it turns into heat, hence why you need water in, water out, and all X-ray tubes require some form of heat reduction. Um, you'll note that there's a uh, potential difference applied across the tube, generally in tens of thousands of volts, and also a potential difference across the cathode uh, which allows a current to flow to, which then boils off the electrons themselves. Now, the metal is target that is in the X-ray tube is normally made of something really tough like tungsten because beta rays, radiation, is uh, really degrading. So you need to make it out of something that's going to live long enough to be commercially viable. So that electron will fly across the tube and it'll come in and it'll come down at the atomic level and see a whole bunch of tungsten nucleuses which have a mountain of tightly packed neutrons and protons in the center. And of course, the electron can get attracted by the protons. And it's also going to have a bunch of a sea of electrons surrounding all these tungsten nuclei. Now, it's not just one electron with a few nuclei. There's trillions of electrons crossing the tube and trillions of tungsten nuclei in the metal target. And they're all coming along and they're all going to go into the tube, uh, through the tube and into the metal target. And they're going to have a variety of results. When the electrons arrive at the other side of the tube, they're going to have kinetic energy. That energy will be transferred, and the idea is to transfer it into x-rays to make a usable x-ray source. Your maximum frequency x-ray is going to come from an electron smashing into a tungsten atom and stopping entirely all of its kinetic energy transferred to x-ray energy. The electrons don't just have to smash into the nuclei itself. Um, they can also come close, and, and that's the example of um, this blue X-ray here, where a, um, an electron has come down and it's, it's changed its direction, slowed down a little, which is why we call this breaking radiation, and it releases an uh, X-ray photon and a lower energy X-ray photon because that electron was further away from the nucleus. The one in black has actually come a lot closer and changed direction in a much tighter curve and converted a bunch more kinetic energy into electromagnetic energy, creating a X-ray of higher frequency and higher energy. And remembering 
that completely stopping the electron in its tracks results in the maximum frequency X-ray. Now, because you've got trillions of electrons smashing into trillions of tungsten nuclei, there's a huge range of energies produced by the X-ray tube itself. And uh, that is something that we'll go to in greater detail later on. Thank you.